Welcome everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. In case you just joined us, we would love to know um, your name, where you're lake located, and why you decided to join us today. So again, please enter in your chat. We're seeing some wonderful people and places, but your name, where you're located, and why you decided to join our webinar today. We want to say thank you again for joining us for um, Introduction to Sovereignty. We're excited to have this with you today. For today. So again, hello and welcome. We like to start our time together with the promise of community action. Community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. So we're want to introduce you to our practice transformation team with the National Community Action Partnership. Um, we are led by Tiffany Marley, who is the Senior Vice President of Practice Transformation. I am Lily Seals, the Director of Practice Transformation. Uh, we have Jennifer Gregory, who is our Director of Mobility Learning and Practice. And then we have our Senior Associates, um, Karis Manus, and our other two Senior Associates who are with us today, Tameritis Baker, Tameritis Baker and Taylor Daniels. So this is, um, we wanna talk to you all about um, the Learning Communities Resource Center um, and the purpose of LCRC is to analyze community action outcomes and identify effective and promising and innovative practice models that alleviate the causes and conditions of poverty. We are committed to building our capacity right in the network to, to fight poverty. When we talk about LCRC, we're looking at, um, we call it the mothership of our initiatives. And it is funded by the US Department of Health and Human Services, the Administration for Children and Families, the Office of Community Services. Um, and we consider LCRC to be the learning hub within the CSBG network to support the identification, adaptation, and implementation of innovative and evidence-informed services and strategies to improve results based on individual, family, and community level outcomes for the network. So our learning community group, we have uh, exploring tribal partnerships. We know that we have community action agencies um, uh, that are um, uh, non-native or non-indigenous, but we have um, within our service within our service area, tribal nations. So how are we all working together? And that is, and this is the beginning, right? We're just trying to build that foundation um, for that need that we have identified within the network. So our agenda for today, we will have uh, welcome introductions, spoke a little bit about um, our learning community group, uh, and we will have our presentation by our presenters and I'll speak to about them in just a second. And then we'll have some resources and upcoming events. So we are really excited uh, for our presenters today um, from the Alliance for a Just Society. We have Libero de la Piana, and he is the senior strategist at the Alliance for Just Society. Libero has 30 years of experience as a writer, organizer, educator for social movement organizations. He was previously the communications director at People's Action and a senior research associate at Race Forward. He is a graduate of the Movement Activist Apprenticeship Program of the Center for the Third World Organizing and is on the boards of the Grassroots Policy Project Illum Illuminative and Writers Alliance. And he lives in East Harlem, New York. I think uh, annual convention, everybody. Uh, <laughs> and we also have Robert Chenet, uh, who is with the Native Organization Organizers Alliance. He is the training director and has supported indig indigenous people's efforts at the request for most of his adult life. At times, his roles have changed, but over the last 20 years, he has been asked to serve in a trainer, organizer, and facilitator role. Robert has worked with the indigenous grassroots groups, tra traditional native societies, tribal governments, and various native-led nonprofits in the U.S. and Canada. He has also worked with people of color and white ally-led organizations in the areas of environmental, racial, 
and social justice through the years. Robert feels that it is an honor to work for the Native Organizers Alliance. Um, and before I hand off to L Libero, I want to make sure that everyone knows that this will be an interactive and engaging, uh, uh, this will be an interactive and engaging event. So um, at some point we're gonna to wanna to see your faces, cameras on, uh, because we will be talking to each other um, and going into breakout. So wanna say thank you all for joining us. And with that, I'm going to hand off to Libero. Thank you, Lily, and thanks to the whole team at NCAP. Uh, it's great to have so many people here on the call and uh, to join us today. <clears throat> and um, I'm gonna pull up some slides. And while I do that, I just wanna uh, say that Alliance for Just Society has been doing a lot of work with community action groups around the country over the past few years, working on issues of racial justice and racial equity. Um, our organization also has a, a long history of working in Indian country and with native led organizations. Uh, and we have a long partnership uh, with uh, Native Organizers Alliance that Robert works for. And um, yeah, we're just really excited to uh, be here and to learn with each other. Uh, and to say, you know, this is a two hour session. It's really an introduction. It's a start. Uh, and not the end of this process. So uh, thank you all for being here. Um, you all have uh, already put in the chat your names and, and where you're from. What we want to do is add one level to that. Uh, you may be familiar with the tradition of doing a land acknowledgement uh, at the beginning of a meeting or gathering. And what we'd like you to do is uh, in addition to if your name and organization where you're located is to put a little information about where, what native territory you stand on, what native land uh, you, you are in. And so I'm gonna put a link in the chat, oops. And I'm gonna ask people to click the link um, and to go to a Miro board, um, which is basically a giant map of North America and uh, to take a little post-it note and put it uh, your 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 location and your name and to stick it on that map. And it's a little hard to see, but you'll see that it's a map of all the different native territories in in uh, North America and around the world. And to give people a sense of where they literally where they stand, um, which is an important part of what we're doing today, is to get people to be conscious about the presence of native peoples and native nations all around them. I'm putting two more links in here. One is a short essay about land acknowledgement, how to do it, how to do it right. Um, and also an interactive version of the first map where you can really scroll in and put in your zip code and find out a little bit more information uh, about uh, the native peoples that are all around you. Um, just, uh, you know, uh, Lily already did introductions for us, so I won't do more, but I'm going to pass it to Robert, who's going to say a little bit more about himself and about our goals for today. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us wherever you're at. Uh, once again, to introduce myself, my name is Robert Trinate. I am from the Kiowa Nation, and I am the training director for the uh, Native Organizers Alliance, and I've been with the Native Organizers Alliance uh, since 20, uh, I think 2018, 2017, kind of blurs together. We do so much around the move. So yeah, I've been with NOAA for a bit. But, uh, you know, just a little bit about NOAA, the Native Organizers Alliance. I'll, I'll refer to us as NOAA using the acronym at times. So that's what I'm referring to. Uh, we're an organization uh, that's dedicated to building the organizing capacity of tribes and Native nations, organizers, and community groups for transformational policy change. Uh, NOAA also provides a forum for Native leaders, organizers, and organizations to work in collaboration with each other and promote uh, their work with non-Native national allies. And we do this at the national level. Sometimes we refer to uh, that work as working on Turtle Island. Uh, it's just, a, you know, another way of thinking about the land that we live in, the territory that we live in. 
uh, you know, sometimes I might say, uh, you know, the U.S., national, U.S. and Canada, North America. Uh, one way we, we talk about that to encompass everything is just to say Turtle Island. So if you hear me saying that, uh, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about some mysterious place, uh, you know, full of turtles in the middle of a lake somewhere or anything like that. So that's just, uh, you know, the, the words that I use. Uh, so NOAA, we, we uh, are doing uh, quite a bit right now. We are active in many different areas. Uh, we're gearing up for the uh, elections uh, in this site. We're doing C3 work, get out the vote, native vote. And, um, you know, I just wanted to introduce uh, ourselves from a larger uh, perspective so you all know who I represent. We do a lot of national trainings. We do state-based trainings, uh, native organizing 101, stuff like that. And we're moving more uh, towards uh, more specific collaboration work. Uh, and we also accept a lot of invitations like this where we are able to share some of the concepts that people talk about in what we call Indian country. When I say Indian country, that's uh, what we, another kind of uh, term that we use to refer to all the native nations here. Um, and specifically because there's a different set of polit political, legal, uh, jurisdictional, uh, you know, uh, relationships that exist there. And so we refer to that as Indian country ourselves and as our land base. So, uh, you know, just to talk a little bit about um, the goals and why we're here. Um, our goals for this are, are pretty simple. We want to gain a better understanding uh, of indigenous peoples and the struggles through the lenses of racial justice and native sovereignty. Uh, we want to go into explaining a little bit about racial justice and native sovereignty and how they intersect. And we want to uh, give some examples of how native sovereignty is essential for native rights, but also for US democracy and environmental protection. Uh, as many of you know, there are many kind of uh, whipsawing or political winds, uh, you know, blowing around this country right now and they've have been happening for a while. Uh, and we're affected and impacted like that, just like everybody else. Um, you know, we have uh, issues that that impact us as Native Native nations, uh, which are um, kind of aligned with what many other people go through uh, in in the areas that you work in. And for example, uh, you know, we have partner organizations in Oklahoma, and they're you know embedded and in, in, embroiled in this kind of contest of power, collective power with the state of Oklahoma. Uh, versus the native nations who are on the ground there. And it's it's played out in the Supreme Court. It's played out in the political field and in arenas. And that's just one area. And we also have you know, areas where we work around environmental protection, uh, climate justice, things like that, that are impacted by federal regulations, uh, movements by uh, people at the, the ground level, at both the state level, uh, local level, municipal level, and stuff like that. It all kind of runs into um, the power that we all work to uh, express and uh, govern from a de democratic place. And sometimes it's a contest of, of what is there, what resources we have available to us and how we want to live in this space together, right? That's really what it comes down to for a lot of us. How do we live in this place together in a way that we feel is just and uh, fair to everybody? So that is kind of why we come to this uh, discussion of sovereignty to talk a little bit more about that, because often you'll hear Native people say this term sovereignty, you know, they'll say our sovereignty and uh, is this and our sovereignty gives us rights to do this a certain thing. Uh, and I want to clarify, and maybe we all get to it with the goals, but this is more of a collective sovereignty. It's not an individual sovereignty perspective. So that's one of the goals uh, about what we're coming here for today. Um, so that's what we're going to frame this as. These are our three goals. Um, so we can go on, go on to the next two slides or three slides, Libro. So from NOAA, our perspective is the U.S. economy and society is rooted in two key elements, uh, the enslavement, slavery of Black people, and the removal of Native people. Historically, uh, it definitely is a uh, at the root of many of the things that are occurring within our communities at both the economic and society level. Um, we, um, you know, the US society are built on uh, those two things. Um, and when we have this conversation, what we wanna do for the native perspective, talking about that is we want to start um, at this place, what we call prior contact. Can we go on to the next slide? So just to give you a, a, a snapshot of uh, historical facts for Native peoples of North America, uh, prior to contact, uh, the population is uh, believed to be estimated between 40 and 100 million people lived in North America before European arrival. Uh, in the same period, fewer than 80 million people lived in, a Western, uh, lived in Western Europe. 
We were independent nations, hundreds of uh, indigenous nations, at least 1,000, each with their own culture, governance, and economies existed before European arrival. And as far as the society and economic uh, conditions were at the time, the native peoples of North America had vast, diverse, and sophisticated governmental and cultural systems. Uh, we had trade routes that ran uh, from Mexico to New England and beyond. If we go into um, you know the North and South, they, were, they ran from Tierra del Fuego uh, in Argentina all the way to the tip of you know north of uh, uh, Alaska. Uh, and we want to start there because many times when people conceptualize Native folks in Native uh, reservations and tribal governments, they do it in the context of the present. Um, but our memory and our trajectory and our uh, connection uh, goes way back. So if we go back in reverse, we recall a time, uh, my great um, my great grandfather, uh, I knew my great grandfather till he lived till the, I was the age of 18. Uh, and he grew up with his dad and they lived in a time when they were they were free people. They were free people, Kiowa people who lived on what are now the plains of Oklahoma. So the stories and memories that he carried with him were from that time. So um, that time seems a long time maybe to some people, but for me, it's, it's a living memory because it was passed on to me. So that is the experience of many native peoples. Um, so that's just kind of a snapshot of where we're at and what we wanted to, uh, our starting point for today's discussion. Uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Libro. Just to, uh, thanks Robert. And just to sort of go from that past to the present, one of the myths that many of us live with is the idea that native people are no more, that they are only in the past. But in fact, what we know is that there are over 5 million Native American, American Indian, and ind other indigenous people living in the United States. It's less than 2% of the population, but it's a growing and thriving community. Um, you know, there are today 574 Native nations uh, recognized by the US government. Um, dozens more tribes are recognized by states or unrecognized. And so there are hundreds of Native nations in, in every state and territory across uh, uh, North America. And there are 326 Indian reservations in the U.S. comprising over 56 million acres of land. Uh, and, and it's actually growing, right? We just this week, uh, the um, I think it was the Rappahannock tribe in Virginia just regained land that was taken from them 400 years ago. And so um, this is also a, a people with a land base, which is also unique in the United States. So this is just to give a little bit of a snapshot that this is not uh, a people who are uh, gone, but a people who are here and thriving. So, oh, oh, before we get to that, so did everyone get a chance to uh, jump on the map and uh, uh, share with us where you are? And if you haven't yet, you can still put your land acknowledgement in the chat uh, uh, if you were able to find out what native territory you're on. And I'm going to see if I can share a little bit of that map just so we can get a snapshot. All right, can folks see that map? Oh, it looks like it looks like people weren't able to get into the map. Maybe the settings are wrong. Um, but what I'll do is uh, I put in the the chat the uh, the link to nativeland.ca, and I think you know for future this is a great tool um, to identify. Uh, where you are in North America to identify the native peoples. And I will say one thing, there's a big, um, uh, when you go to nativeland.ca, and let me see if I can just jump there so then I can show you how it works. It's a great tool, but it's not definitive, right? These, uh, these boundaries, these other things are basically um, uh, 
one, it's a process that's in development. Like they, these weren't settled once and for all uh, boundaries of nations. They were basically territories where people uh, lived and migrated and over time. And I'm gonna go ahead and share this. So this is native, nativeland.ca. And um, you can see also they're overlapping, right? Sometimes there were contested areas. Sometimes many different nations shared one area. But if you, um, if you zoom in, you can search for your city, your town. I can say right now I'm down here in South Florida and it's Seminole land and Tequesta land, but it's a great tool. And the reason why we do this, why we have land acknowledgements, why we use tools like this to identify what the traditional inhabitants of the land are and were is one to, uh, it's part of some of the native principles that we learn about um, you know, being a good neighbor, about being invited into territory, about um, being conscious of where you stand and who, uh, who is around you. One of the biggest problems is people don't recognize the native peoples in their own communities, in their own spaces. Um, and so we do this in order to acknowledge that, to recognize it. Many Native peoples had a tradition where one ha has to be invited into the land um, as, a, as a guest, as a visitor. And so we do it for that reason as well. And I think that one thing in, in the essay that we shared, we want to caution. Sometimes land acknowledgement is done in a way that sort of says, well, these people were here and now they're gone you know, great, let's move on. And what we want to say is land acknowledgement is also a commitment. It's a commitment to uh, fight for sovereignty, to recognize uh, the presence and role of Native peoples and the importance of Native communities. And also to be clear, it's not just about acknowledging uh, Native peoples, but the whole history of the land. It's about being conscious about where you stand, who came before you? Who are we responsible for in the future? And to sort of absorb those uh, native and indigenous principles of, of, uh, of being responsible to future generations and responsible for the past generations. So we share that and we hope that, um, that you can uh, adopt sort of native uh, land acknowledgements as a practice that is also part of recognizing our responsibility. Any quick questions or thoughts about land acknowledgement, any experiences people have, are using this in your community action agency or in other ways? I think I've definitely heard of land acknowledgements before, but um, I think that they've, maybe done, been done in the way how you said, like um, maybe not super appropriate, like, oh, you were here and now we're here. Um, so I like how you said that it's a commitment. I think that's important and something like I will definitely take away from this. That's great. Others? Our program um, is working on a land acknowledgement that we can post. Um, we work in a Head Start and Early Head Start program. And we serve three different tribes in our area. So we wanted to try to come up with something appropriate that we could post and acknowledge for our families. Great. I'm curious if this group has any resources for connecting with like active native groups right now. So I, you know, again, that, that second step of acknowledging the, the history and then making that commitment I rarely see in the land acknowledgements um, any resources being shared about what we can, how we can involve ourselves in support now. Um, do you have any suggestions around that? I think we're going to dig into that more as we go forward. And it's, this might be a good transition where we can talk about sovereignty and um, how land acknowledgements relate to sovereignty and how a non native groups and individuals can relate to native peoples. Um, 
And then if you still have questions about that, we're going to have some time at the end where we can chat more about making connects with local groups. Uh, Robert, I'm yeah. going to hand it back to you and I'm going to share my screen where we can talk about sovereignty. Okay. Uh, thanks, Libro. Um, so this next section, I'm going to talk about uh, sovereignty, uh, some of the, you know, definition that we use just for discussion purposes to get us started, because there are a lot of different definitions uh, in, in a native country about it, but there's some that are really more useful, I find, than others. Uh, and we also want to talk about um, not just the, de the definition, but we're talking about principles and stuff like that. So we'll talk about principles of native sovereignty and kind of what it means in governance now today in the time that we're at. That we're at. Um, and to, you know, to go back to uh, something I uh, think, I don't think I mentioned it in the very beginning, uh, but I want to mention it now is that this is uh, kind of the a kind of a one on one kind of uh, basic level of uh, view of sovereignty from a native, native, native perspective. Uh, so there's a lot of things in there to for us to dig into, uh, to go into a lot of details, uh, even get into some discussion points or debates that uh, we don't have uh, probably the uh, time for today to get into all of the things that are related to sovereignty, because it's a very, very big, expansive subject. So we want to touch on some uh, key pieces, though, you know, a definition, some principles uh, and governance. And then we'll have discussion at the end, like Libro is saying, to kind of dig into things uh, while we are here together. Uh, but we found that, you know, many of these discussions, uh, you know, uh, take place over a long time, you know, uh, hours, days and stuff, if you have that amount of time to dedicate to this. So we're uh, looking at this as a starting point for us. Um, so what is native sovereignty? Um, when we talk about sovereignty, we use this definition for uh, us to get going here. Sovereignty is a legal word for an ordinary concept, the authority to self-govern. Hundreds of treaties, along with the Supreme Court, the President, and Congress, have repeatedly affirmed that tribal nations retain the inherent powers of self-government. These treaties, executive orders, and laws have created a fundamental contact contract between tribes and the United States. Um, so what are some of the principles to this? Uh, we can go to the next slide. So some of the key principles of native sovereignty are this. Uh, sovereignty is inherent. It's not granted. When we talked about the pre-contact uh, reality of native nations, uh, they had sovereignty uh, at that time. It was not something that needed to be bestowed upon them. It was already inherent in the way they operated. What they did, they made uh, treaties with each other. Uh, they recognized boundaries when they needed to. They collaborated, they shared resources. They filled their own uh, uh, people to uh, carry out tasks on their behalf. All the things that we associate with sovereignty in a modern context existed with us uh, pre-contact. Uh, so it's not something that we inherited it or it was not granted to us. It was inherent, it was not granted to us. Uh, as for treaties, treaties are agreements that recognize sovereignty. They do not grant it. Uh, just a simple recognition that you exist in this state in this condition. Um, the next point of uh, principle of sovereignty is nations, peoples have sovereignty, not individuals. Uh, we say that just because the native nations, uh, uh, sovereignty is understood amongst us to be something that is collective and uh, seen from a perspective as a, of a group as opposed to just individuals. Um, tribal sovereignty is territory based. We have a land area that we are associated with uh, that you know can change over time, but usually is based upon land. Uh, the form of sovereignty can change for each nation. Um, we say that because uh, some uh, nations, native nations may emphasize one area more than others. If you live in a uh, coastal region or a region with a lot of water, you may emphasize uh, your sovereign rights of fishing, right? Uh, if you live in an area where it doesn't have a lot of uh, water, uh, maybe you live in a more de desert area, arid area, um, you may not be fishing itself, it may be just the water rights themselves because it's not there, right? So each area you live in geographically, uh, there's going to be uh, a change sometimes in what uh, that nation uh, emphasizes. And if you you're like some places, they live really very close to an urban area. Uh, what they may emphasize maybe is uh, commerce, right? Because there's a lot of people come to the area, they want to assert the sovereign right to businesses, development and things like that. And that might be what their, what their, what their um, sovereign uh, issue is. It's, it's around commerce. So it's gonna change from each, each one uh, place to place. Uh, sovereign uh, relations are nation to nation. 
uh, U.S. states have no authority over Native nations. Um, that's the way we understand it. Uh, tribal sovereignty is acknowledged in the U.S. Constitution and has been repeatedly upheld uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court in various forms. Uh, and sovereignty is enshrined in international law. Uh, it's an important part for uh, uh, for people to understand, I think, here is that many Native nations you'll find uh, participate in international forums like the United Nations, uh, places like that, uh, because uh, they are uh, choosing to represent themselves at the international arena uh, and uh, want to be a part of some you know, developments at the United Nations and international law forums and things like that. So oftentimes you'll see uh, Native nations doing those kind of things. Uh, so what does this mean in terms of governments, governance? Native sovereignty and governance. Um, these are some basic ones. This is not an all encompassing list uh, for native sovereignty and governance, but these are some key pieces. Uh, we choose our own style of government. Uh, anybody who's worked with tribal government can tell you that uh, many different forms exist amongst many, many different nations. Some of them have a, a three branch government, government system uh, of, of operating. Uh, some of them have di direct democracy, like maybe just a, a small executive branch that's um, voted on by the entire tribe directly, representative democracy, things like that. Uh, some of them try a blend of some traditional models with uh, contemporary styles of government, and some of them change. Like some of them change the constitution based upon what's happening around them and decide that they're going to uh, do a new model because many governments uh, inherited the style of, of gov governing uh, through the 19, um, like 1950s, 1930s, 40s, uh, that um, was based upon a model that we, a lot of us didn't know, and many have chosen to change their style of government, which is their right. So we also create our own citizen citizenship criteria. Uh, again, that differs from nation to nation about what they want to emphasize. We establish our own judicial systems. Again, this goes back to the style of governments. Our, our my, my uh, native nation has four branches, the executive, ju uh, judicial, uh, legislative, and the council itself, which is all citizens, which is a fourth branch. Uh, but we have a judicial system uh, which operates as well to be a check and balance in that those areas. Um, we can establish that any way we want. We create and enforce our own laws and policies and codes within reservations in our Indian in our native territory. Uh, that's one of the things that we do with sovereignty. Uh, we can regulate property codes uh, and distribution of resources within our, our territories. Uh, we can develop economic enterprises. Many people you know, are familiar with casinos, but it's not just casinos that Native nations choose to operate. They do many different things, uh, not just around gaming. Uh, some of them uh, operate manufact manufacturing businesses. Uh, they operate uh, you know, production companies. Uh, some of them, I know in New Mexico, I'm reading about one of the tribes there. It's actually starting, has built a, um, a movie set because they want to attract uh, the film industry to the reservation in New Mexico. So that's one example of how they are choosing to develop their uh, economic base. Another thing is um, we establish education systems such as tribal colleges on our native nations. Some of them have um, you know run run their own their own uh, elementary, junior high, high school, and even tribal colleges uh, within their territory. Um, we also develop environmental agencies for water, land, and other related concerns. Many times you'll find uh, some of the um, agencies you contact will be like, you know, what we call TIPO, uh, Tribal Historical uh, Preservation Office. Uh, you may work with an EPA that's established there. Uh, there's many different ways that tribes uh, decide to uh, structure their government and operate uh, as a sovereign entity. So that's just some um, examples of native sovereignty and governance today. Uh, we can uh, keep, keep going, but we'll just uh, let's stop with that list and you can think of anything more. So we just want to, you know, close this part by uh, just reemphasizing Article 19 of the uh, United States Constitution, and it says states, um, oh, no, so you, you, you and Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I'm sorry, I'm talking about the International Forum. Um, earlier, this is a document that was created called the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Article 19. And it says that states shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free and 
prior and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. This is uh, in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and it really uh, speaks to the idea and the principle of Native nations and uh, different nations uh, living together in a, in a way uh, in which you know consent is given before uh, things are carried out in their territory. And it's kind of a fundamental part of what we believe is uh, Native nations uh, is a bedrock piece of our sovereignty. Right. Gabriel. Thanks, Robert. And I, we should say that the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples has not been uh, signed by the United States. Uh, one of the few countries in the world that has not done that. Um, so our, when, we, when Alliance for Just Society and Native Organizer Alliance, when we think about uh, understanding Native peoples in the U.S., we think that it's important to have an understanding of, of Native sovereignty, as we just discussed, but also racial justice. Um, some people think uh, all you need to do is look at race, that uh, understanding uh, Native Americans, uh, American uh, indigenous peoples is, is really a racial question. And some say, well, it's, it's really just a question of sovereignty. These are our Native nations that have rights. Well, we think it's both because in this country, in our history, Native peoples who were hundreds of tribes in the past and nations and remain you know, 574 independent nations today, um, they were racialized and are racialized as a, as a single identity, which doesn't recognize the different cultures and traditions and histories, but it is a fact, right? We are all racialized um, and we are sort of subject to the logics of systemic racism. So we want to just do a quick Reminder, some of you may be familiar with this from uh, your work with AJS in the past, uh, to, to really understand uh, racial justice and how it relates to uh, Native peoples. Can I get a volunteer to unmute and just read this quote? I can do it. Um, racial justice aims at full liberation for all. Racial justice acknowledges that racial e equality and racial equity are necessary, but not sufficient. Racial, racial justice in action is the proactive reinforcement of policies, practices, attitudes, and actions that produce equitable power, access, opportunities, treatment, impacts, and outcomes for all. Right, and we have this great quote from Martin Luther King from the March on Washington. Now is the time to rise from the dark, desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. So this is important because in order, you know, we have to understand that native peoples in this country have a lot of uh, um, economic and social problems brought upon by this system of, of inequality, a system of racism. And we have to recognize and understand how that happens. So yes, we have to fight for equity, but our real goal is full liberation. And that includes uh, fulfilling and enforcing the inherent sovereignty of native peoples. Um, so what do we mean by racial equality, racial equity, racial justice that we just talked about? Can someone volunteer to read uh, the first definition here? I can. Go ahead. Racial equality aims at equal treatment regardless of race. Racial equality is race Line, which in a society built on systematic racism can serve to reinforce racist outcomes. Great. Yes, we all want to be equality before the law. We want to be treated equally. But we also understand that in order to address these deep inequalities, we also we sometimes have to have race conscious policies and processes. Someone want to volunteer to read racial equity? Sure. Racial equity aims at 
equality of outcomes, achieving racial equity requires race conscious measures that address historical and current disparities. Thank you. Yes, exactly. So in order to get equality of outcomes, sometimes we need different policies, we need different resources for different communities because of historic in a, a, a you know, uh, oppression, historic challenges. So, you know, one a good example is that this country, for instance, had a policy uh, in the Homestead Act, which gave free land to white families who would, quote, homestead that land for Western expansion. Well, that one, that homestead policy excluded Blacks by law, and two, it was taking land from Native people by armed force, right? So, you know, if we want to understand why there's a historic wealth difference between white families and, and people of color, Blacks and Indigenous people, we have to understand that policy. And to solve it, we can't just say, okay, now everyone is equal, it's an equal playing field, go for it. No, we actually need equity policies that, that uh, are, tar are uh, targeted in order to reach an, uh, an equitable outcome in order to overcome that. Uh, targeted universalism is a great example of equity measures. You want universal outcomes, but you have to have targeted uh, policies to get there. Uh, someone want to volunteer to read the last definition. This is Mandy, I can. Uh, racial justice aims at full liberation for all. Racial justice acknowledges that racial equality and racial equity are necessary, but not sufficient. We don't want equal access to an unjust system. Exactly. So equity is just a measure. It tells us are, is a community overrepresented in poverty? You know, is it overrepresented or underrepresented in educational attainment? It's a measure. But racial justice says, is that, do we have equal access to an unjust system? Do we just want to have the lowest common denominator? Like everyone is treated badly? Of course not. Community action was born not from a, a, a passion to equalize poverty, it was born from a passion to eliminate poverty. And so that is what real racial justice is about. And we think that that's an essential piece along with uh, um, uh, sovereignty for native nations. So just some quick principles. One, we believe racism is a system of oppression. Uh, sometimes people say, well, I don't have a racist bone in my body. It's like, well, racism isn't a bone disease. It's a system of oppression, right? It's not about you. It's about the system. Racism is real, but race is not. We are racialized. These are, there's no scientific definition of race. In this system, we are defined by race by how we look. And it's different in different countries. But in here, this is how it works. Um, so we understand the impact of racism is real. It has real impact on people's lives, but race is not real. Um, racism is not monolithic, right? It changes. It operates in different ways in different regions. It also changes over time. Uh, it, racism looks really different in Brooklyn, New York, uh, than it does in Montana, you know? And uh, sometimes people get locked into sort of uh, define notions of how racism operates. Um, racism is integral to the economic and social structure of the U.S. So as we talked about in the beginning, just at a financial level, the vast wealth of this country, a huge portion of it came from theft of, of Native land and the enslavement of, of Black people and others, right? huge amount of wealth. This is not an aside. It's not an add-on. This is a fundamental part of the structure of our society. You can't understand poverty without understanding racism. Uh, racism primarily benefits a small elite. You know, we do, we talk about uh, white privilege. We talk about the role that uh, everyday white people play in the system. That's all true. But the vast, we know from your work, you know, that um, the vast majority of white people do not uh, economically or socially benefit from this system 
it's it's really a pack of of lies, right? So that's important too. Racism operates along with other systems of oppression, uh, with uh, uh, sexism, with uh, homophobia, with ageism, all the ableism. Like this is not r racism on its own. Racism plays a really defining character in the U.S., but it doesn't operate alone. Uh, we believe you cannot have racial justice without neighbor, native sovereignty. And this is really important, right? You can't just sit, uh, uh, do it without. It's uh, native peoples have a different uh, basis uh, 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 for their standing. And lastly, racism is not natural. This is created by humans and it, it, it had a beginning and it will have an end. Humans can uh, adapt and change it and eliminate it. The last point, uh, again, which is probably a reminder is that racism operates differently at different levels. And sometimes we get caught up on the micro level, which is our intern, the, the ideological level that internalized racism, the, the uh, feelings and the thinking of inferiority and in people of color, of superiority in whites. We, we get focused on the interpersonal interactions, whether it be microaggressions or whether it be hate crimes. Uh, those are all interpersonal. We focus on the micro because it's the most visible. And it's where this society says, this is what racism is. Racism is a feeling. Racism is hatred. You know, if you want to prove racism as a court, you have to prove intent. Did they mean to take away your civil rights? And what we want to do is more and more focus on the macro level, which is it doesn't matter what the intent was. What is the impact? Is, is the system, is the institution, its policies and practices creating and recreating inequities and oppression in our communities? It's the systemic level. It's all these things that add up to uh, um, a, a system that is uh, grinding people down and creating massive inequities. So it's all important. It's important to understand it the micro level and the macro level, but we put our emphasis on how do we change systems that recreate racism and poverty over and over again. I'm going to hand it back to Robert. We're going to do some exercises to get people thinking about how the heck did we get into this, this situation? How do we get out? How to understand sovereignty a little bit better? Yeah, and uh, I want to kind of go back uh, and because I think this part of this next section, which is going to be, uh, uh, first of all, I'll ask for two volunteers to read uh, next few slides for us. It's a reading theater, which we do to emphasize uh, a historical moment for us to reflect on. Uh, can I get two two volunteers before I go forward? Okay, there's one, Mandy. Thank you. Mandy has volunteered. Uh, and okay, and Anna, Anna Victoria has volunteered. I'll call on you two uh, here in a second and I'll sign a roll to one of you because you're going to be reading two characters in this uh, play. But the question was asked uh, earlier, I just saw it in the chat. Uh, and I think this this um, reading theater kind of kind of goes to that question. The question is, I am curious to learn more about what it means for a tribe to be federally recognized. Uh, how did they accomplish that? And why would they do that? Are there pros and cons to that? Um, so what we're talking about here, are like what Libro said, are systemic changes, and it's a historical process. So we have to back up sometimes, many times, to see uh, how we answer these questions about that. So uh, what does it mean for a tribe to be federally recognized? Essentially, that means that they have a trust relationship with the federal government um, in, in this, in this uh, political structure. That means they have certain, uh, you know, certain uh, things that come their way, resources exchange for, uh, uh, you know, maybe sometimes it was seeding uh, certain things for a certain amount of time in exchange for uh, resources for, um, you know, support and things like that. There's this exchange that happens between the federal government and a native nation that's called the trust responsibility. Um, but the question is, how did they accomplish that? Well, if we move back further in history, that kind of answer comes uh at the very beginning of the inception of the United States in 1775, in which the United States established uh, an Indian committee to deal with trade and, and treaty negotiations with native nations. And along that way, along that route, uh, 
we're able to claim more jurisdiction and um, uh, I guess uh, control over native nations as westward expansion move this way. So these things happen in, in, in incremental places and in, in incremental spots, but what they what happened was there was a diminishment of our independence and sovereignty over a period of time. So how did we become uh, federally recognized? Again, it's a process that started with the uh, Indian Committee of 1775 got transferred to the War Department because the relationship at that time was became war with Native nations and became, it, it again, became another shift into another department called the Bureau of Indian Affairs, right? And so these happened over several decades, but they didn't happen uh, necessarily because we voted on it. We, did, we, weren't, we didn't go to the ballot box and say, that's just what we're going to do. Uh, there were several things that happened historically that changed the systems uh, for us uh, that made it um, so the relationship now is that we are in a federally recognized uh, relationship with the United States government, and there are pros and cons to it, right? There are there are some good things that uh, are good for Native people, and there are some things that people, Native people, would rather change. Uh, so we look at this as not like necessarily uh, uh, static points in history, like where we live at now, and this is just the way it is. I think for Native people, many times you will find uh, there's a constant uh, striving, a constant push to to build Native power and reestablish and regain what was either de deliberately destroyed, uh, taken or subverted from us. Part of the work that we do is to try to rebuild those things out. Um, so within that context, each Native nation, you know, has their um, view on what's good, good or bad about Native uh, federal recognition. Um, and uh, again, you know, this is a historical process that has put us where we're at. And to kind of illustrate that, we want to start with uh, this um, reading theater. So the two volunteers will ask you to read. Um, I'll just go ahead and, and Mandy, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and give you the character of Andrew Jackson. I know you may not want to be Andrew Jackson, but for the purposes of this, of this exercise, I'll assign you Andrew Jackson. And uh, Anna, uh, I will assign you John Ross, who is next. So um, um, you have, uh, Mandy, you have two slides uh, and I want you to read them out loud for the, the group. So it's one and two slides. So go ahead and read the whole thing. Andrew Jackson. I am Andrew Jackson, future president of the US. I'll also be a founder of the modern democratic party. I made my riches selling land that didn't belong to me. I sold plots of land reserved by treaty for the indigenous nations and what would become Tennessee. I will own over 300 Negro slaves in my life. And I am one of the main architects of the removal of indigenous people from across the U.S. South. Today, in 1813, I am leading U.S. troops and Indian allies in battle against the British and their allied Indian nations. I'll be militarily responsible for capturing vast acres of, and correct me if I'm mispronouncing these, Muscogee, Choctaw, Muscogee. Yeah, Muscogee. It's quite, yeah, do the best you can. It's all right. It's Muscogee, Choctaw. Chickasaw and Cherokee land. Yeah. Okay. Then I will build an army and invade Florida, killing the Seminole Indians and freed Negroes there. Florida will soon be under my military control and then be bought by the US. Thanks. Okay. In 1830, as president, I will sign into law the Indian Removal Act, which will pass by just four votes, which will authorize me to quote, negotiate, end quote, the removal of the Southern Indian nations, pushing them west past the Mississippi River, even though our current treaties pledge our protection of their current ancestral lands. I once said, build a fire under them, and when it gets hot enough, they'll move. Uh, thank you, Mandy. Anna, do you want to take it up and read the next two slides? That's John Ross. Okay. Uh, I am John Ross, and in a few years, I will become the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. I will, over the next 50 years, lead my people through the Trail of Tears and the U.S. Civil War and eventually unite our factions into a united Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma. Now I am serving in the army of Andrew Jackson. We are fighting against factions of the Muscogee Nation that once occupied a huge area in the Gulf Coast region. This conflict will become known as the War of 1812. I and many Cherokee have sided with the U.S. in a conflict between the U.S. and the European powers of Britain, Spain, and France. Many Muskegee chose the other side, but the real losers of this war will be all Native peoples. 
Over the next decades, the US will violate our treaties and take more and more land west of the Appalachian Mountains by theft, threat, war, or trickery. Our loyalty will be betrayed again and again. Okay, thank you uh, too very much, uh, Anna and Mandy for reading uh, the parts of um, Andrew Jackson and John Ross. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So we, we lift these stories up uh, to draw on some lessons and we've touched upon them. We mentioned some of them uh, and I'll take um, you know a couple of examples from people, but I wanna read three that uh, we, you know jump out to us um, and then I'll ask for a couple of more and we'll do another exercise like this. Uh, so US, one of the lessons from 1812 is US law and government often backed or ignored uh, white settler theft of land and violence against natives. Another, another lesson too uh, for us is that even so land theft and westward expansion was contested and controversial even among white folks. And the lesson three is that Native peoples were often forced to take sides among colonial powers, but got little from the bargain of taking sides. Um, do we have a, a couple more uh, additions to this? You can do it in chat too, and we'll go ahead and do this, uh, another version of this uh, in a, to kind of move along the historical line for us. Is that right, Libro? Yeah, it'd be interesting to hear other observations people have about the scenario. And if you don't have one right away, we'll have a discussion uh, at the end of uh, the session too. So if you are sitting with something and thinking about it and not, don't really want to share it right now, go ahead and hold on to that and we'll we'll come back to it. Unfortunately, some of these lessons occur from you know year to year and place to place. So the bad lessons, good lessons are in there. One thing I'll point out is uh, that the Indian Removal Act passed with by only four votes. Like this was not something that, you know, people rallied around. Um, it was it was debated, it was contested, it was opposed. Um, and I think that that's, it's important to remember because sometimes we think of history as sort of this unstoppable march towards oppression and <laughs> conquest, but, but there was resistance and there was opposition and a lot of people were horrified by Andrew Jackson. Okay, uh, thank you. Can I get two more volunteers? It's just um, with some of the treaties that were negotiated, um, you know, and uh, Native people, um, I guess, agreed to certain terms, for example, being provided food because they had been uh, nomadic and now they were going to have to be stationary. How very often some of the terms of these, many of the terms or all of the terms of the treaties were violated and still led to people losing their land, whatever land that they had been given and forced onto, uh, you know, and also people dying and all sorts of different terrible outcomes. And so it's not just enough that these treaties were negotiated is that um, the U.S. negotiated them, um, you know, without um, any desire to follow through. Um, thank you, Laura. We have Alex and Aaron to help us with the next section of the reading theater. And I'll just add to that too. Many of the uh, of the some of the treaties and um, agreements actually were uh, done under coercion. Like they weren't. It wasn't done like a free and fr free prior informed consent kind of situation. Uh, and many times, if you read the terms, they were shifting depending on who was available to sign, who was recognized to try sign, who was appointed. Uh, authority to sign away everything, you know, on behalf of a people uh, that was unelected and all that kind of stuff and unrecognized. So some of the the the, the treaties even then were not, uh, you know, done under the best of, you know, above board circumstances. Um, so uh, Aaron and Alex will do the same as um, we did the last time for reading theater. Uh, Aaron, Alex, I'll have you do Samuel, uh, Samuel Worcester. So go ahead and Alrighty. read the first. I am Samuel Worcester, a New England missionary who has lived among the Cherokee as a guest for many years. Back in Georgia, I helped found the Cherokee Phoenix, the first newspaper in their language. The discovery of gold on Cherokee land in 1828 sped up the push for removal by local whites. Then in 1830, I was arrested for violating a Georgia law that forbid whites from living in Cherokee territory. 
I believe that that law violated Cherokee sovereignty or self-rule. The case went to the U.S. Supreme Court and we won. The court said that no state could undermine the sovereignty of native nations. Worcester v. Georgia will become the basis of all future rulings relating to native sovereignty. But President Jackson wouldn't enforce the ruling. I went to jail. Then Georgia's militias and mobs began attacking Indian families. Under pressure and backed by the Indian Removal Act, Jackson forced the native nations to sign treaties giving up their land. The Cherokee Council never approved the Treaty of New Ichota in 1835, which traded Cherokee ancestral lands for this unknown land far to the rest, west. But some Cherokee leaders signed the treaty, which was all the excuse the whites needed. Aaron, do you want to read the part of Sally, Car Sally Carpenter? I'm Sally Carpenter. I was born in the old country and was forced to move with my family to Indian Territory in 1837. One day wagons stopped at our home and men commanded us to gather what few belongings could be crowded into the wagons. We were taken away and left our home never to return. Soldiers marched us to a nearby fort where we were imprisoned for months. Hundreds died in these prison camps from disease, starvation, and cold. Women were raped, men were beaten, but times became even more horrible after the real journey began. My grandfather died during the, tra the Trail of Tears, as we call it. Most of the old and sick died, many children too. Some walked and pulled carts and wagons. I was lucky to have shoes, many didn't. A few were able to ride mules or horses. Between 1830 and 1850, more than 60,000 people, including thousands of Negro slaves, were forced to walk up to a thousand miles through rough terrain with little food. As many as 4,000 died before the March West. As many as 17,000 are believed to have died along the way. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Aaron. Uh, earlier, we were talking about um, some of the lessons from 1812. Now we jump ahead, you know, 47 years, kind of a trajectory of the same region with some of the same characters and people involved uh, and see uh, kind of what's become of uh, those initial actions and the behaviors and actions of people involved from 1812 to 1849. So some of the lessons that we can draw from 1859, uh, we have like the first one, 1812, we have a few uh, here that we wanna share for you to think about and also uh, come up with uh, some lessons that you uh, want to share when we have our group discussion. So from uh, 1859, um, white settlers um, called native peoples savage, but it was often whites who were brutal and inhuman. Uh, another lesson from 1859 is sovereignty and other rights for natives are enshrined in U.S. law and the Constitution, though rarely enforced. Uh, and then 1859, a uh, lesson is treaties between the U.S. and native nations are the law of the land, but have been systematically broken. And that kind of goes to uh, the point that was being made earlier prior to us reading this uh, re reader's theater from, from 1859. So, you know, hang on to uh, these lessons here. Think of some that, you know, occur to you. Uh, and we're going to have a group discussion here, uh, but we're continuing on the line of history here. We have one more um, theater, uh, reading theater for you, Libro. And before we jump forward in history, I think it's important to note that the Trail of Tears, which impacted the five uh, so-called civilized tribes, it, this was just one episode among many of, of mass uh, extermination, forced migration, imprisonment. I think earlier we had a, a participant in the meeting who's Dine from the Navajo Nation. The almost the entire Navajo people were put in into slave camps and work camps, rounded up. Uh, the long walk, exactly. Thank you, Kansas. Um, so this happened again and again in different places around the country. Trail of Tears is a term we've heard more than others, but it's just one example. So we want to jump forward because, you know, this has been a dark chapter, right? Um, we've seen lessons, both good and bad, like there's a, it's an interesting tension in the history, right? So sovereignty is recognized by the U.S. government, but then undermined. You know, there's a contest over what's going to happen. There's a fight over westward expansion and how that will happen and if it will happen and what are the rights of Native people. We have folks like Worcester 
white allies who stood with native people at different times. And so, you know, we want to make it clear that native history in Turtle Island is not just one of being beaten down and oppressed, but of resistance, of thriving, of, of beating back. And we want to jump way forward to talk about how, how sovereignty relates in a modern context. So I need two more volunteers to do readings. We got Sherry, who's going to be uh, Jack Dalrymple. And we need one more. Hannah, who's going to be Dave Archambault. So please read. Sherry, I think you're first. You want to read, uh, Jack? Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. I am Jack, how do you pronounce it? Dar Dalrymple. Dalrymple, Republican governor of North Dakota. The Dakota Access Pipeline, DAPL, is a $3.8 billion pipeline, dollar pipeline project. It will stretch from the northwest of our state all the way to the Southern Illinois, carrying oil from the Bacon, Bacon oil fields. Now, after years of planning and building, thousands of protesters have gathered on the border of the Standing Rock Sioux Indian Reservation to try to stop the project. That's why I called out the National Guard and ordered an emergency evacuation of the encampment. Some have said that I'm trying to usurp and circumvent federal authority with this move. But this is North Dakota and the Standing Rock Tribe and these protesters have no right to block this job creating project. I am, I am ordering the protesters removed for their own safety. Winter is coming and it's dangerous to be camping outside. Sure, police used fire hoses on the protesters the week before in freezing temperatures, but I blame outside agitators. I have also asked neighboring governors to send sheriffs to ke help keep order. It's true that this is the same pipeline. The same pipeline was rejected when it was planned to cross the Missouri River, upriver from the state capital, Bismarck, because it would endanger the water supply. That's just common sense. The Army Corps of Engineers has jurisdiction over the permits for the pipeline, but I can't be expected to wait forever. Eventually, the Obama administration will put a stop to DAPL, but the incoming Trump administration will let the oil flow again in just a few months. Of course, this pipeline will be caught up in the courts for years from now. Thank you, Sherry. Hannah? Thank you. I am David Archambault II, chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. An amazing movement has grown here at Standing Rock this year. We have opposed DAPL from the beginning. The proposed pipeline is very close to our territory. It also crosses our ancestral lands and will disrupt known and unknown burial grounds and sacred places. It is also a threat to the drinking water of the 8,000 citizens of our nation in North and South Dakota and the millions of people of all races living downstream. We were never properly consulted about um, the Dakota Access Pipeline going back to 2014. We opposed it through official channels. We sued, but the Black Snake, as we call the dangerous pipeline, continued to make its way toward us. Then young people in our tribe began a movement which led to a prayer camp near the planned site of the pipeline crossing. These youth inspired women elders like La, La Donna Brave Bull Allard to join in. Then the camp grew and grew. Soon native leaders and organizers from across North America joined our elders of the seven council fires. I'll do my best here, Oseti Sakowin or the great Go ahead. No, no, you did a good job. Okay, we're the great Sioux Nation as they sat in deliberation and prayer. We are water pro protectors, not protesters. 
we are prayerfully opposing this attack on Mother Earth and our sovereignty. Now, nearly 10,000 people have joined the camp. Over 400 Native nations have come to join our circle. It is the largest show of intertribal solidarity ever. And global support has forced the divestment of $5 billion from the pipeline. The pipeline will eventually be built, but we still have won an important victory here at Standing Rock. Thank you so much. Um, before we get to lessons, I wanted to just acknowledge the passing of LaDonna Brave Bull uh, Allard uh, last year, uh, who was an important leader at Standing Rock. Um, and let me ask, how many people were at Standing Rock encampment or visited? I, many, many people, Native and non-Native, uh, visited there and uh, joined the prayer camp. I'd just be interested to know if anyone on, on the call was there. Um, all right, let's go to some lessons. So the first lesson is sovereignty is an important pathway to toward environmental justice and protecting Mother Earth, right? That Native communities are often at the front line of environmental crisis, and they're at the front line of the fight for environmental rights because it's so important. And uh, as Dave Archambault pointed out, they were fighting for their water rights, but also the rights to millions of people downriver <laughs> to have clean water as well. The second is the prayer camp and resistance showed that native values can interrupt the dominant racist narrative. I'm sure everybody here heard about Standing Rock in the media. It was one of the biggest uh, uh, disruptions of the dominant narrative that native people are in, invisible or gone, that um, it, it was in the news, it was a major conversation, and it, it, uh, it showed that native values could uh, really uh, disrupt this dominant narrative. And three, that solidarity, Native and non-Native, is essential to upholding sovereignty, right? The Standing Rock tribe could not do that alone in court or through official channels. It took um, tens of thousands, tens of thousands of people on site and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands around the world standing with them and even then it was very difficult. Um, so it was a victory, uh, but it was, you know, in the short term, the pipeline was built. I will say there's an update to this story, uh, which is that uh, now that pipeline is not flowing in anymore, but, uh, you know, there's always new attempts to undermine sovereignty for resource extraction and drilling and pipelines um, going forward. Are there any other observations from that scenario or memories or things people want to just put forward? Oh, and Molly in the chat said that she uh, gathered supplies. Uh, absolutely. A lot of people raised money, gathered supplies, signed signatures, uh, you know, complained to their governors for sending uh, uh, troops uh, there to disrupt the prayer camp, all the things that people did. Uh, to support it. It was, it was huge. Any other observations? I have one. Sure. Um, I was just going to say that for me, that was a, a big eye opener for how many of us want to support and uplift tribal sovereignty and just don't know how to actually be engaged and involved in a productive and good way. Because I think like what Molly was saying is like, so many people just went because they felt that pull and ended up being a strain on resources in some cases. And so trying to be, I think that was a big lesson for a lot of people of how to be an ally in the best way, or just realizing maybe that that wasn't, you know, the case. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for sharing that, Anna. Um, absolutely. This was a good example where some activist group said, like, everyone go to Standing Rock, and the tribe was going, no, no, we, because of the one winter was coming, the stretch of resources, but also that they, like, they literally couldn't feed people. They didn't have enough porta potties. It, um, and they were left with millions of dollars in cleanup fees, et cetera. I will also say that there were some national nonprofits that raised millions of dollars 
around this issue and gave nothing to the tribe or local groups. And it was a very, I think you're, you know, one of the, the indigenous principles, um, you know, we always lean on is this question of, like we talked about in the land acknowledgement, it's about being invited. You know, native nations are, are sovereign territories and we don't just go, we, we ask to be invited. We, we open a relationship. And I think one of the things back to this question that was asked earlier and that you reinforced, like how do we, how do we get involved? How do we support sovereignty? How do we connect with native groups? I think oftentimes the first step is just getting to know someone. It's about inviting someone to you. Um, and uh, there's a group that we worked, I worked with in, in Buffalo and they were try trying to do this work with native groups. And, and they were like, well, how do we go and do this? How do we go and do that? And I said, well, why don't you invite them to you? Why don't you say, we're, we're an organization. This is what we do. We'd like to share what we do and, and our resources. Um, come visit, send a delegation. You know, we want to invite you to lunch or coffee. We want to invite you to show you, start a relationship. And it's not going to be right out of the gate, um, you know, full trust. It's going to be slow and steady. But I think that, that's how those things happen. And the other thing, and this is true with any community, we always try to build a relationship in a crisis. It's like you wait for the crisis and then you're like, how do we make it connect? And like, that's the worst time because people are like, who are you and what do you want? And where have you been all of my, you know, our lives? So build a relationship now, because then when the crisis comes, you can get on the phone and say, hey, I see there's a crisis. How can I help? Because you know me and we, you know, you know, there's some trust. So I think those are good principles. Yeah, and I think uh, kind of just to build on that too, um, even as even as a native person, I've done you know I've been able fortunate to travel to a lot of different places, my life and and work with people in different uh, native nations. But even then, I must I'm a, I'm a I'm a stranger. I'm a guest in their territories too, so uh, I have a lot to learn as well when I go to different native nations, especially if it's a different culture. I'm a Plains culture native, like the TP Buffalo horse and all that, but that's very much a different culture from the Northwest. You know, where they have canoes and they live on salmon, and 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 they have a totally different system than we. Even though there's a lot of parallels, so it's always been you know to my benefit to to do as much uh, you know learn about the history, the culture, the tribe, uh, their background you know, their, 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 their uh, systems of, of governance, everything that I, I can uh, before I, I go there, just because it gives me a, a leg up and, you know, them not having to explain everything to me. Uh, and I kind of know, I'm aware of things that I should avoid, you know, because there's protocols too uh, that, uh, that we learn, even like I'll, I'll share really quickly is that uh, one of the protocols in my nation is that we can't have anything to do with like the animal, the bear, like, you know, we can't eat, have bear claws, ro you know, robes or, meat or anything like that from a bear uh, because it's sacred to us. And I went to a community where they were serving lunch and there was, we were 60 miles from the nearest town on a dirt road and the, uh, the matriarch served us a, a bear soup, you know? And so me and friend, luckily he had the same taboo in his nation. So we were able to kind of talk about what do we do here? So we went and told her like, we can't eat this because we, we, we can't eat bear. And so she was really understanding. She goes, oh yeah, I, I understand that. She goes, I actually have some other food here on the side that you y'all you can eat and we had it but so you know this always navigating uh learning uh being open and being honest with people and uh again it's it just takes you know being being willing to to learn more about folks and pay visits to them when the times are good too so that's all are there any other observations about the standing rock uh ex example or this scenario liberal yes I remember seeing that on CNN, and it actually took me back, to be honest with you, um, seeing the, uh, the annihilation of people's rights. Um, we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. And I remember the feeling when I saw that on CNN, like, you know, these are these people's lands, and once again, <laughs> we're doing what we can to try to take something away from someone. and you know, brown and black people 
we again have come a long way, but we have a long way to go. And so that's what it reminded me of. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Tameritus. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, you know, I was personally connected to the camp and 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 my my partner was uh there for the almost the duration and and I'll say that like there was a lot too that didn't reach the full media and there were some really really dangerous things that happened armed militias that tried to go and invade the camp and cause uh incidents um the uh the uh, the drilling company uh, when they were given uh, the the map of all of the burial sites and sacred places and told like this is this is here they went and used that to destroy them preemptively instead of saying oh we'll avoid these they went and and literally tore them up and you know they were like well we'll pay the fine. And I mean, there were just despicable things done. Um, so yeah, it was a it, it's a it's one of those things that shows the power of solidarity, how much can be won, but also the depravity of racism, and and these things continue. One other observation is that this question of the federal government and the states, right? The federal government wasn't always a great partner for the tribe in that situation. But in the end, they were actually a foil to fight back against the what the state was trying to do. So this is one of the things that I think we kind of hinted at in the definition of sovereignty and governance. Tribes have to navigate these really complicated situations because they have to deal with the county, they have to deal with the state, they have to deal with the federal government. And yet, in fact, under law and, and treaty, for most things, the, the, the county and the state has no say. They only have to deal with the federal government. But we see that that conflict is happening all the time. In fact, just recently, there was a Supreme Court ruling uh, just this year, which undermined a Supreme Court ruling from just a year ago. The Supreme Court ruling from a year ago, McGirt said the tribe has jurisdiction over tribal people in, in terms of, uh, of the jurisdiction of the police force and the courts. And one year after they decided that, they said, well, not really. The state has the say, and they undermine their own decision. And it, it just puts the tribes into chaos. It's constantly pulling the rug out from under them. Um, one other example is uh, during COVID, people may know that tribes all over the country tried to establish strict COVID restrictions because native communities, uh, people were dying at higher rates. There was some, you know, the Navajo nation and others were just ravaged. Uh, by COVID. And so they set up really strict separation and, and COVID restrictions. And governors said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> and they tried to under undermine the, the COVID rules that tribes set up. And the federal government had to step in. And so you see how like this question of sovereignty is a principle. It isn't clean cut. It's always being, people are, you're always having to fight you're always getting stuck between the states and the federal government and navigating these things. Any last quick thoughts before we go into small groups to have some more discussion? Um, I think for, for me, what I had definitely observed during that time is um, a lot of grassroots organizations had popped up from that point as well. Um, stemming from one of the ones that I know of uh, the Changing Woman Initiative that talked about Native women's health. 
and maternal health. Um, so in women that did bear children during that time, um, my sister was a midwife that came to help during that time and started a nonprofit organization called Changing Women Initiative, um, which is still thriving to this day and helping um, Native American women in the Southwest um, New Mexico area and providing free health care to women who want to have home births and bringing that back into our own communities, which maybe at some point we all birth that IHS hospitals. Um, so there were some positive, I think, pieces that did come out of it, but also too, to see that side of it is, um, you know, in their area, um, we did see a lot of racism that a lot of the community members, they received on a daily basis, you know, and the people who came um, did weren't welcomed either. You know, the Native people did see and observe a lot of that racism in that community. Um, um, just, you know, there was areas, I think even recently, I don't know if you guys saw, but there was um, even a hotel recently that closed their doors to Native American people. To this day, that still happened. And one of the owners um, of this hotel put up a sign saying, um, we will not allow Native American people into the to stay here at this hotel. And I think that was like this past year. Um, so there's things like that that are still happening to this day where, you know, you, you don't think that it would still happen, but it is, you know, and also like for our Navajo Nation at this point, we still have community members that don't have running water or electricity. Um, so, you know, everyone's like, wow, that's still happening to this day. Yes, it is. You know, um, that's basically all of the hardships and things that we're still overcoming to this day. Thank you for sharing that, Kansas. And I absolutely, you know, both, you know, really beginning with Standing Rock and and there's been a real uh, resurgence of Native movements, Native uh, uh, service organizations, like you mentioned, the uh, uh, Native women's health and, and, and in response to the crisis of COVID, et cetera. I think it's been amazing. And yeah, I the, we... Robert and I know the folks at NDN Collective, which you know started a boycott of this hotel in Rapid City that literally said natives are not welcome, um, which you'd think should be illegal, but there you go. Uh, yeah, here we are. So I put in the chat um, two questions. We're gonna spend uh, about 12 minutes in, in uh, small groups. And um, if the folks from uh, NCAP can help divide us up into groups of like four or five randomly, we have two questions. What are, what are the lessons of, for sovereignty in the Standing Rock uh, DAPL struggle, that uh, last example? And what ways can sovereignty be protected by Native people and allies? What are some things that could be done? And think about your own work, your own uh, uh, your community agency, the advocacy work that you do, the service work you do. Pick a reporter to take notes and click this link, the Menti link there, which has the two questions and you can answer them right in the Menti so that we can do the report back. So those are the two questions. You're gonna get thrown into small groups for about 12 minutes. We'll come back at 3.40 Eastern. And, um, and uh, yeah, we'll see, you. we'll see you shortly. Libero just wanted to confirm you said groups of four to five. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Taylor. Everyone should be assigned to a room. You should be able to go to that room. Welcome back, welcome back everyone. Welcome back. Uh, it sounds like there was some good discussions. We got some good feedback here on the Menti. Um, we're gonna do just some quick feedback from the groups and then jump to any last questions and discussion for our last little bit. Um, I just wanna point out here, like people said, Freedom and rights of one indigenous nation affect all nations. I think this is such a great idea. This is something that that Judith LeBlanc, director of Native Organizers Alliance, always says that like 
native sovereignty is not just for natives. It is actually important for democracy in this country. We can't have full democracy without sovereignty. Um, it's difficult to enforce sovereignty when US government ignores agreements. The government consistently betrays tribes and treaties, not understanding sovereignty. Another example of the US as a nation preying on those that they see as vulnerable. Sovereignty is not being honored. Government is, not, is still imposing. We don't hear the whole story of the issues. These are great. Any um, quick uh, additions to this? Some lessons of sovereignty from the, the Dakota Access Pipeline? Anyone want to add anything real quick? You know, one thing that Alicia, Kenny and I talked about from Alicia from Arizona was um, just how, what's the best way to be an ally? And one thing that we talked about, I think, which was good perspective for me is maybe focusing on folks who, who do have the possibility of, of some understanding um, and maybe not burning up your energy on folks who are adamant about being against it. As disheartening as that is, maybe it's it's better to to focus that energy in a productive way. Yeah, absolutely. Focus our resources. Um, you know, and one of the things we talk about uh, AJS when we talk about moving from principles to practice, people are always like, "I have these principles. How do we show them?" And some of it is just like what can you do? You can educate folks. You can do some research and share it. You can put up posters uh, highlighting history or highlighting Native peoples and cultures in your state or area. Little things like that have an impact, and part of it is breaking the invisibility, right? Um, and Standing Rock was one of those things that broke through that invisibility. Uh, let's go see if I can. Uh oh, I was trying to go to the second question, but it didn't work. Here we go. So in what ways can sovereignty be protected by native people and allies? Uh, strength in numbers, amplifying of voices, respect of cultures and traditions, giving, offering financial support whenever possible, native peoples and allies working together, stronger together, elevating the voice of native people, taking direction from those directly impacted. These are all great. Through education done by allies, constant pushback, community actions, bringing the struggle of indigenous people in the country, more exposure to native communities by non-native leaders. And the other thing is, you know, native people are all over the country. You know, yes, some of your agencies are in areas where there's um, reservations, uh, tribal nations with a land base, and some you're going to have cities like uh, Chicago and and call and uh, Minneapolis and Denver and New York they have big tribal uh, native populations that are urban areas um, but even small towns and rural areas have native people so you know what is the native population of of your the group you serve uh, how are you uh, are you serving them properly are you serving are you addressing their needs their cultural needs um, have a conversation. Uh, so there's a lot of things that can be done for sure. So these are all great examples. I thank you all for sharing and participating. Um, I am going to kind of, Robert and I are going to open it up for about 10 minutes just for the questions, discussion, reflections, things you learned or didn't learn or things you want to learn next. Uh, so we can have a little bit of back and forth discussion before we wrap up. So yeah, we'd love to hear from you. What was useful? What isn't? What do you want to know more about? What are things that that uh, you have questions about? Alicia, go ahead. So I've recently heard about land back, and I don't quite understand the whole concept. Do you have any insight? <laughs> Because it can sound a little intimidating, like, oh, if we give all our land back, all the land back, where is the rest of us going to live? So Robert, I didn't really know what sure. the the purpose was or the Want intent. One, Robert. Um, so I guess it's kind of nuanced in a way because I think probably you heard about it as a campaign or as a slogan, uh, which comes from an organization that um, 
I think specifically around federal uh, federal lands, uh, kind of federal lands that are um, in public spaces, shared lands that are uh, contested with native people. And I think it's uh, most of that, as I know, is defined around that. It's not private property or anything like that. It's around uh, public and federal lands uh, being returned back to native peoples when they were taken uh, unjustly uh, and being restored is kind of how I understand land back to be. Uh, and it depends, like if you ask somebody at, from a different perspective, who's not maybe a part of that um, uh, organization or that campaign, he might say it's it's something a little bit beyond that or a little bit uh, different than that. Uh, so that's kind of how I can understand it though, land back to be kind of restoring something that was stolen uh, by the federal government and is now not in private property, uh, but belongs to the public to be put back to use for the native peoples it was taken from. Thanks, that's helpful. Yeah. So plus on what Robert was saying, I think that like land back is a specific campaign of this group NDN Collective that we know and work with. Um, and it's become kind of a cultural political movement that's sort of signifying representing the, the demand for land. Um, so it's like a, you know, it's complicated. It's like both a specific thing, but it's also just sort of a like a, a pushback on narrative. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are tribes actively in the process of regaining land that that was taken from them. And also many treaties had uh, stipulations that federal land would revert to the tribes if they weren't used or if there was some violation. Uh, so there are places where there's legal fights like over the Black Hills, um, there's legal fights over Alcatraz Island in the Bay Area, uh, things like that where the federal government actually is supposed to return those lands. Uh, Laura? Um, I guess my question has to do with, um, I know that historically there were a lot of people that were taken away from their communities, a lot of indigenous people. I know that in my area, I'm in the Southwest and there was a practice of, um, you know, native people, native children being taken away from their tribe and used as enslaved labor. And, you know, two or three generations out, they're completely disconnected from whatever indigenous group they came from. Um, but there's a lot of movements of people trying to reconnect with their indigenous roots. And specifically in my area, a lot of people reconnect with Mexica, Aztec kind of roots um, and other groups. And so just kind of, what does that mean in this movement when there's people that were separated who have some indigenous, um, um, you know, background, um, are trying to reconnect with their indigenous roots in, in different ways, but not having, you know, in essence, a, a group or a nation to go to. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, I'll go ahead and I think, I, I, I mean, I think that, you know, I, I know a lot of people, I have friends that are in, in the same situation, uh, here, living here in Denver, Colorado, you know, I have a lot of uh, people who would identify as, as Chicano or Chicana or different, different um, uh, identifiers for themselves. Uh, and it is a quest. It is a quest back to try to find their roots. And it's not an easy one. Uh, and sometimes those things are, are uh, not, not, uh, you know, very clear cut. I think I come from two perspectives, I think taking them two angles, I think the ones who are on that journey, uh, I understand it, it's it's something that I, you know, I, I all I can say is I can I support that journey. Uh, the people that I know, I've taken them to different things, different functions. Uh, and some of them are at the point where they just uh, kind of embrace the culture they live in. So example, if they live in a Plains culture, they may decide they wanna learn that history in that region there uh, and then keep searching for their, their roots. And I think from the perspective of people who have closer ties and identity that they can actually name uh, because they were just fortunate to have grown up in that, uh, I think there's a lot of empathy and compassion for that for that journey as well. Like to not, to to know that people, through no fault of their own, uh, are on that kind of pathway, and I think to the best of their ability, people support it. 
and try to you know give give advice invite people into uh cultural forum forums and, and circles and stuff and, and try to encourage them to continue on and build community because community is is not static you know we all we all work in community community includes the people around you the land and i always tell people this is not just the people it's like the the land the the beings the plants the the animals and your relation your knowledge to all of those things within that circle uh and so people um you know, that's, that's the community they live in at that time. Um, and we all, uh, you know, have that work to do, even if you come from a place that you have a specific identity. I'm Kiowa, there's not a whole lot of Kiowas that live in Denver, there are some. Uh, so my community around Native people is a blend of a lot of different things. It's the Cheyenne and Arapaho nations, the Ute nations, Navajo, Lakota nations uh, in, a, in an urban area. And it's kind of amorphous at times. But I think if we ground it in Indigenous values and principles that speak to us uh that's kind of what resonates with me uh, it's not a easy answer but it's 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 an ongoing kind of search and journey that you you know you come to the one thing I, I totally agree with robert the one thing i would caution is that in recent years with like some of these like dna testing things there's been a lot of times where people sort of do a test and it says oh you're two percent native and people are like i'm indian and you know that everyone knows about uh, Elizabeth uh, Warren, and and I think that it's like this is why we distinguish between like the personal identity journeys that we're on and like tribal sovereignty as a collective process, because the tribal nations are political bodies, and they're not defined by you know U.S. notions of race right? Many tribes were alliances or confederations. Uh, some tribes like the, the Cherokee and the Creek and others had formerly enslaved people are members of those tribes. They're not biologically, you know, linked to the tribe historically. So I think the, the thing we have to be careful about is just imposing this no, American notion of like race and biology to the identity our identity as indigenous people like that's i think the challenge um as opposed to like you know people who have real relationships to tribes and 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 native um nations as sovereign bodies so that's the little belinda oh sorry i was trying to unmute myself so thank you First, thank you so much for hosting this. This was super informative and I really, really appreciate it. So I'm with the County of San Diego and I'm in the process of developing a land acknowledgement for our officers. Are there any like tips or resources that you can direct me to so that knowing that this is a government agency and I want to be respectful, I want to provide the correct information and do it intentionally and not just do it as a check mark off our list. Um, any tips or, or advice or things to be conscious of while, while I develop this? Uh, check out the essay I wrote, which I shared. I can put that in the, the chat again, which brings up some cautions, maybe how to do it. Um, Teen Vogue had a great article, I thought, a while back on sort of land acknowledgements. Robert, other tips? I think the essay you have is, is kind of, it's got quite a, it's pretty good. It covers quite a, quite a bit of ground. And I think following, following those things about uh, the advice given in there is, is good. I don't really have anything big other than to say, I, I will say about acknowledgement sometimes uh, there is a critique of it, but I, you know, a lot of it comes from a place where there are a lot of, there's already a lot of knowledge from about native peoples. Uh, and I would say that's, you know, Canada. So some of the critiques I hear come from Canada and a lot of people there that are non-native already know a lot about native people. Uh, whereas the context is different here. Like I still meet people, if like you can believe it or not, who have never met a, a native person. Like you got a public car run into somebody and they'll tell me, they'll ask me some, some crazy question, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, and I don't think that's the, the case in other areas like Canada. They, uh, they make up a lot bigger part of the population. Uh, so, um, I say that, uh, yeah, read the essay, think about it. And I think it's anything that adds to the pe people's historical and political knowledge of indigenous peoples or encourages them to do that is, is a positive thing that I can think of in, in the area that we live in, history, historical times that we live in. Any other last thoughts uh, before we uh, turn things over to Taylor and the NCAP folks? 
reflections, observations? I just want to say one thing that's been really helpful for me is uh, just following a lot of um, native influencers on TikTok and on Instagram. That's been really educational for me. And it's also just really fun to watch. They're really inspiring and really incredible, but it's super educational too. Yes, native Twitter is a whole thing. And uh, there's been a just explosion of, of creativity and great, interesting politics. You know, it, it just a few years ago, the first two native women got into Congress, the US Congress. And now we have Deb Holland as the, you know, first cabinet minister in the US native. There's uh, just been an explosion of, of leadership, cultural acknowledgement, news recognition, uh, and the movements are on the on the rise. So it's a very uh, exciting time. And uh, I, I want to thank you all for being here and participating in this discussion. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll hand it to Robert and then we'll hand it back to Taylor. Uh, yeah, I'll just say quickly in closing, I appreciate everybody coming here and giving us the space to, to learn and have a discussion with each other. It's an ongoing process uh, for, for you know, not only y'all, but us as we journey and alone together and figure out more ways of uh, being strategic. And there's a lot of us being strategic and how we make moves together, build community, build power. Uh, and kind of take just tack on to you know what we've been talking about as far as protocols and stuff. One thing that I found, again, to be useful is to try to follow uh, the the knowledge and lead of the people's communities that I live in. Even though I live in a community, uh, some people have ways of doing things that I try to understand as best as I can uh, the history of there. Not as only uh, somewhere that you're going, but where you're at, and kind of how things have developed to be. Uh, the way they are where you're at and how you got to be there and all of those things taken together kind of make up this, this journey that we're on. So I want to say thank you to your organizations and I appreciate it very much. Oh. Taylor? Thank you. Guess on me now. So um, I first would like to say that this uh, session is recorded and it will be shared with you um, in the follow-up email. Um, in the next two to three days. Um, so you can look forward to that email if you registered for um, this session. I just wanted to end with a few resources and upcoming events for you. Um, Community Action Academy, we have two e-courses there um, on family center coaching. Um, so we have 101 and 201. Um, so if you need access, um, that's available. It's free to you. Um, and I can, um, and if you don't have a community action or a Moodle account, you can sign up for that. It's definitely free and it has a lot of exciting information there. Um, also, you can check out our webinar, our webinar Wednesday calendar. Um, it'll be on the NCAP website, but we're also in our follow up email with other resources. We'll link that there. So you can see, um, you can catch any other great webinars that we're having. We usually have them on Wednesdays. So that information will be to you as well. Um, we're really excited. We're going to be doing racial healing circles next week. Um, that's going to be on Tuesday, August 23rd. Um, racial healing circles is experience that um, evolves every time that you engage in one. So if you pre previously participated in one, um, you, may you may attend to deepen your knowledge and experience. Um, there's a QR code here. So if you have your phone out, you can just um, take a picture of that and you'll be directed uh, to that registration and then we'll make sure that you get a link to join us in a group. Annual convention 2022 in New York City. It will be starting on August 30th to September 2nd. We are very, very excited. Um, LCRC will have a variety of sessions that'll be there and this is just um, our contact information. So if you have any questions for us and you need any other additional information, please don't hesitate to contact any party on our practice transformation team. Um, all of our emails is here and you will also have that information in your follow-up email. And last but certainly not least, we would love to know um, your reflections on today's session. So we have a post evaluation, I mean, post uh, training evaluation. Um, you can find the link there. It's also another QR code. So if you just have your phone handy, um, it's a probably about five, five or so quick questions. And that is all that we have for today. We thank you all for joining us. And I think we might be a minute or two. Oh, we are exactly right on time. So
So thank you so much for joining us um, and look forward to a follow-up with all of the um, meeting materials from today. Have a good one. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, Lee Rell. Thanks, Robert. Have a good one. Thanks, Robert. Good to see Thank you. Thank you. All right. See you later. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye.